Welcome everyone to this program called Messages from the Afterlife, Dr. Wayne Dyer and the secret to communicating with the other side. I'm here with Wayne Dyer's daughters, Sage Dyer and Serena Dyer Pisoni, also renowned spiritual medium, Karen Nelly. Welcome to the program, Sage, Serena and Karen. Thank you. We're excited to Thank be here. You. Yes. All right. And uh, as you will see, Wayne Dyer is a big part of this program as well. Yes, you heard that right. Wayne Dyer transitioned in August 2015, but he is very present in the world today, as you will see. He has very important messages to share. We will get to these during the program and in a brand new masterclass for those who want to go deeper. The masterclass is called Life After Death, Dr. Wayne Dyer's Teachings from the Afterlife, and the training to receive your own messages. Be sure to stay tuned for details. Now I'm going to introduce Sage, Serena, and Karen, so you are aware of the important work that they're doing in, on the planet. I'll begin with Sage Dyer. Sage Dyer is a 31-year-old woman from New York City. Sage grew up in Boca Raton, Florida, and moved to New York, where she graduated from NIU with a master's degree in psychology. She is the co-author of the book, The Knowing, 11 Lessons to Understand the Quiet Urges of Your Soul, which explores how she was able to return to the teachings of her father, Dr. Wayne Dyer, after he passed away. She has published a children's book titled Goodbye Bumps that tells the true story of how she was able to heal herself as a child through the power of the mind. Sage often traveled with her dad to speak to his audiences and even appeared on his PBS special. Sage is a mother of two boys and enjoys traveling, learning, and spending time with loved ones. Good to have you with us, Sage. Good to be here. Thank you, Steve, for that introduction. <laughs> And Serena Dyer is the sixth of Wayne and Marceline Dyer's eight children. Serena attended University of Miami, where she received bachelor's and master's degrees and now lives in South Florida with her husband. She spends her time traveling, reading, blogging, and working to combat children's trafficking through several local organizations. Together with her sister, Sage, Serena recently authored the book, The Knowing, 11 Lessons to Understand the Quiet Urgence of Your Soul. Good to have you with us, Serena. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. And Karen Noe is a renowned psychic medium, spiritual counselor, and healer with a two-year waiting list. She is the author of We Consciousness, Your Life After Their Death, Through the Eyes of Another, and the Angel Quest Oracle Deck. She is the founder of the Angel Quest Center in Waldrick, New Jersey, where she teaches classes, gives readings, and practices alternative healing. You can listen to Karen on the Angel Quest show and on her podcast platforms. Good to have you with us, Karen. So glad to be here. Thank you. All right. And we have a lot of important things to get to. So let's get started. And uh, Karen, let's begin with you. Can you tell us about the meeting with the Dyer family, Sage, Serena, their sisters and mother, Marceline, at your office in New Jersey when Wayne Dyer first talked from the afterlife through you to the Dyer family? Oh, gosh. Really? Okay. Um, let me just begin by saying there were synchronistic events that brought us together, which was amazing in itself. And the first of which was when I was uh, ready to speak for an author event in Orlando, Florida, the day before uh, they were going to be doing a tribute to Dr. Dyer. And um, we're on a bus. I'm sitting on a bus for the Hay House authors, as well as Wayne Dyer's family to go from the hotel to the conference center uh, to for the tribute. And I'm sitting there and there's one seat available on the whole bus and it happened to be next to me and in walks Serena and she sits next to me and the rest is history. Um, the first meeting, oh gosh. <clears throat> so I've been doing this for many years, for decades, uh, receiving messages for deceased loved ones. And I am booked for two years ahead of time. So I'm doing something right, but I've never done a reading for Wayne Dyer and his family. Now I never knew Dr. Dyer in person. I know him now. I was a huge fan. I read his books. I went to his conferences. We were fellow Hay House authors, but that was about it. So I'm ready to go to the appointment. I'm driving to the appointment. And as I'm driving a car, I'm yelling at Wayne. I said, Wayne, you better come through today. I was really nervous. I said, you better come through. And with that, a car kept me, cut me off. And as it cut me off, the license plate said Dyer one on it. And I said, oh, my God, he's coming through today. So I got my phone and I'm trying to take a picture of it. And did you ever try to take a picture when you're driving? Just doesn't work. It was all blurry. In any case, I got to my center and I'm meditating. And finally, 
Marceline, his wife, came with Sky, with his daughters, Sky, Serena, and Sage. And the first thing they did, right, ladies, you went to the bathroom. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, I'm asking Wayne, you better come through. Now, before I say anything, after we leave the physical body, we retain the same personality as we had when we were here in the physical plane. If you're quiet, you're still quiet. If you're loud, you are still loud. So in comes Wayne. I am trying to make a good impression. I'm quiet. I don't know if you know that, but I am. I'm trying to make a good impression on the dyers. And all of a sudden, they're in the bathroom, and Wayne is coming through saying to tell them to get out of the bathroom. I felt like I was going crazy. So I said, Wayne, I can't. He said, tell them to get out now. Tell them, hurry up, hurry up. I said, oh, my God. So I knock on the door. I said, I'm really sorry. But your dad is saying, and then all of a sudden he overtook my body and it was like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And he made them come out of the out of the bathroom. I said, I'm really sorry. So it was a little piece of me, a little piece of Wayne. And it was like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> but he spoke to them all differently, which was amazing. And this is the first time I met them. I mean, I met Serena on the bus, but he spoke to Serena more forcefully. And then he spoke to Sky, very soft spoken. And he spoke to your mom, you know, Marceline, a little bit more so soft spoken and Sage in between. But he spoke to them each in a different way. But Serena, yours was the strongest, I think. I mean, he spoke to you really forcefully. And um, I, I'm not going to go through all the messages, but there were very specific messages that I wouldn't know. I think Serena's going to share maybe one of them now. Um, I think they asked to share a few a few things at the appointment for him to share, and he did, and so forth. So he indeed came through that day and on subsequent days for a couple of years after, and still now. Serena, can you tell us about the message you received from your father during this meeting that we were just talking about the meeting at uh, Karen's office in New Jersey? And also to be clear, this was after he passed in 2015, and he is still speaking to you and your family today, often about the leadership role that you and Sage are playing in the world, correct? Yes, that is correct. And we met with Karen in her office, and it was in October of 2015. He had passed away in August of 2015. And the reason why I remember that so clearly, I'll, I'll get to in the story, but Karen is exactly right. Um, she's very soft-spoken and quiet. And so when we came in, she was, oh, I hope you guys made it here okay, and I'm excited. And and then all of a sudden she was saying, now, come on, let's go. Come on out of the bathroom. Let's go. We, we got to go. We got to get started. And the way she said it immediately, I looked at my mom and sisters and said, oh, my God, she sounds exactly like dad when he would be rushing us to school in the morning, telling us, let's go, let's go get in the car. We're going to be late. And so, um, you know, I, I can completely attest to the fact that it seemed as though he had taken over her body and was um, letting us know that he was fully there and fully himself in his personality, as she said. We had all asked for certain topics to be addressed or to, to have um, Karen, with really our dad speaking through Karen, give us um, just certain messages that we wanted to know about or certain things that we wanted her to reference so that we would know that it was really our dad. Because as you know, he was a very well-known author and speaker. And um, a lot of people actually had been sort of claiming to be receiving messages from him or um, channeling him or that kind of thing. Karen was doing none of that, not claiming anything. In fact, how we came to know her, as she said, really was just a totally divinely orchestrated coincidence. But regardless, we had skepticism. So we wanted her to say some specific things, things that would not be discoverable or knowable through a Google search. And Karen, you know, hit them all nail on the head for every single topic that we had said in the car ride there. We want Karen to say this and we want Karen to say that so that we would know. But specifically, I will tell you that um, uh, one of the things that that absolutely was just astounding was that um, Karen at one point looked at me and said, um, and your dad is saying uh, 4th of July and fireworks and he's saying, congratulations, that you are pregnant. And I had a six-month-old daughter at the time, and my dad had met my daughter. Um, so I was a little disappointed because I was thinking, well, he certainly would not confuse um, a baby that I just had with me being pregnant. You know, it's not like he wouldn't have remembered my daughter because he met her. 
And so she said, so I said, no, I'm not pregnant, but I did just have a baby. So I was just pregnant. And she said, no, 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 you're pregnant. He's saying pregnant, 4th of July, fireworks, something. And I was thinking, I mean, I, we were in Maui for the 4th of July. You know, we watched the fireworks together, but my daughter was there. I, I was like, I just don't really know what you're talking about. And I said, but there's no way I'm pregnant. I just had a baby. Um, you know, I'm breastfeeding, which I thought meant that you could not get pregnant. And anyway, I just was adamant. And my sisters and my mom were looking at me like, you know, you were having wine last night at dinner. Are you, uh, you know, are you lying about being pregnant? I said, no. In fact, when we leave here, I will happily go take a pregnancy test to show all of you, including you, dad, that I am indeed not pregnant. Um, but anyway, the conversation continued and she said so many things that were so spot on that um, I did start to have you know, a little doubt, like, am I, am I actually pregnant? I just didn't think it was even a possibility. And then sure enough, when we left uh, the office, when we left her office and the meeting that day and I took a pregnancy test and it was positive. And when I got back, from our trip to New York, I went to the, uh, the OBGYN and they take a measurement of the, the baby. It's not even really a baby yet. It's, it's a tiny little thing. They take a measurement. It's your most accurate measurement um, to date. And it is the due date predictor. And it's um, the most accurate because at that stage of pregnancy, everybody's cells are essentially the same size. So they can give you a pretty accurate due date. And my due date, sure enough, was the 4th of July. So the fireworks and 4th of July reference was um, not only letting me know that, uh, you know, I was pregnant and my dad was aware of it, but that um, he was also aware of when she was going to be due. And my daughter, Windsor Wayne, made her debut um, July 1st. So she came three days early, just in time for my husband and I to celebrate our second wedding anniversary, which also happened to be that day. Um, so I think she was a little surprise uh, gift from, from the other side. And I love to think that she spent those nine months just preparing you know, with my dad before she made her grand entrance to, our, to earth, before she was even conceived really. So anyway, yes, it was quite a miraculous uh, situation for me to have been told by my deceased father through a medium, which is Karen, that I was actually pregnant and what my due date would be. So, and Serena, uh, just quickly, he then called in through Karen during the birth, correct? So your dad was there yes. at the time of the birth also, right? Yes, I was in labor and I was actually in the process of pushing and Sage was in the room and Sage said, um, she was holding her phone so that she could take pictures for when the baby was born and her phone started ringing. And um, she said, oh, it's Karen. And I had an oxygen mask on and I ripped it off and I said, <laughs> answer that. And so Sage said, oh, hi, Karen. Um, yeah, uh, oh, you're calling, you have a message for Serena. Um, Karen didn't know that we were together. Karen didn't know that I was in labor. I didn't post anything on social media about you know going into labor. Um, there was no announcement or anything. And so um, for Karen to even call Sage with a message for me, and the message was that my dad knew that I was in labor and that I was about to bring this baby into the world. And he just wanted me to know that he was there. And, um, and it was, you know, just something that there's absolutely no way she could have known that either, that in that moment, I was mere, you know, minutes, seconds away from giving birth for the second time. And, and he wanted me to know that he was there and receiving those messages from her. Um, and not just those, there's been countless over the years, truly countless for me and my, my family members. Um, I have absolutely no doubt that she is a clear channel and she has a gift and he has been able to speak through her and send us these reminders and these um, pieces of advice and these warnings and these love messages all this time in the, you know, over five years and six years now that he's, he has been gone. And we're going to get to all of these here or many of these <laughs> during the program. So Sage, let me come over to you. So during this process, while you and Serena were reconnecting with your dad's teachings, you felt called to write a book together and bring some of the very important messages to, to the world, right? And so can you share a little bit about uh, these messages? Yeah. Um, so like you said, we felt called to write this book. Uh, I had no intention of writing a book, but after he passed, I was, um, you know, I was grieving and I was missing him and I was looking for him. And as I talk about that, we're going to talk about in the program, um, I was 
a believer in all the things he taught. And I was, I believed on one level that yes, he was still with us, that he was giving us signs, but I was also skeptical and I, and I really wanted proof. Um, and well, this meeting with Karen was one of the big proofs that I needed, but in those early days, I felt really drawn to his teachings. And so I found myself listening to his recordings, reading his books, um, and just diving into his work. And um, at the same time that I was doing that and digesting all of his work, I felt called to write. And like I said, I, I didn't intend to write a book. I just every day was finding myself at the end of the day when normally I would be tired and so excited to lay down on the couch and relax. I felt drawn to my computer like I needed to write. And I was finding myself writing like a thousand words a day um, at what was probably the busiest time of my life because I was in school and graduate school. My husband and I had just started a business. Um, I had an internship, so I had a job, like a nine to five job, but I was still finding the time to write this book. And um, what I felt myself found myself writing were just really um, my own sort of digest digestion and interpretation of my dad's biggest teachings, um, things like surrendering and becoming the observer uh, to your life and recognizing those times uh, when you're really trying to swim upstream or against the current and you're fighting the losing battle and, you know, which is sort of the place I found myself in after my dad had passed away because I was wholeheartedly uh, resisting that he was gone from the physical plane. And um, so getting in touch with that notion that I needed to surrender to my situation so that I could find him here, which is ultimately what happened. Um, so we wrote about that. We wrote about um, this idea that of taking the path of least resistance. Uh, I can remember a time that I was with my dad in the car and a song uh, came on the radio, which was I Hope You Dance by Leanne Womack, which is, you know, it's a beautiful song. It's full of all these um, really profound truths that are simple. You know, I hope you never fear those mountains in the distance. I hope you dance and so on. And anyway, he said, let's listen to this song. I just love this song. And uh, he said, I agree with every single line in this song, except for one. And I want you to see if you can figure out which line I would disagree with. And so my dad, our dad loved to uh, play little fun educational games like this. So I said, okay. And we, we turned it up and we listened to the whole song. And at the end of the song, he said, did you figure it out? And I don't think I got it right. But what he told me afterwards, I'll, I'll never forget because he said, there's a line in there where she says, I hope you never settle for the path of least resistance. And he said, uh, you know, it's such a beautiful song, but she ruins it with that one line because you should always take the path of least resistance. You know, when the universe is offering you resistance, it's time to look at that. It's time to change course um, and to find yourself back on that path of least resistance because that's when you're moving in momentum with the universe, with divine guidance. Um, so we, we write about that, this whole notion of taking the path of least resistance, surrendering. We also write about uh, looking for signs um, because uh, looking for signs, looking for divine guidance and because it's always available to you um, and you just need to tap into it and you need to be open to receiving it, which was something I had to learn. I was initially closed off to it. I wanted my dad to show up the way that I was used to him showing up, which was in the physical with a body that I could touch and talk to, you know, with my voice. And I had to um, open up to a new way of finding him here. And once I did that, the signs started to roll in. And so I felt connected to my dad again. And I know without a doubt that he's still here with me. So we wrote about that. We wrote about, um, this notion of choosing sooner, we write about forgiveness and the power of it. Um, uh, we tell a really incredible story about um, our dad's experience with forgiveness and Serena shares um, an incredible story about her experience with forgiveness. And uh, lastly, I mean, we write about so many things, but one other that comes to mind was we wrote about this idea of finding your purpose. Um, 
but shifting it on its head because we don't believe that there is just one purpose for you in your life. Uh, I wholeheartedly now believe that you can find purpose every day. You can find purpose in each thing that you do each and every day at all the different phases of your life. Um, so we write about that, helping you get in tune with your life's purpose on a daily basis, not just one big goal out in the future. So. Okay, wow, a lot of wisdom there. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Sage. Serena, I'm gonna come back over just to you. So when you Google uh, Sage and Serena Dyer, you see hundreds of stories uh, even including from USA Today and other media channels that are picking up your spiritual messages and uh, that, that you and your sister are sharing. So for example, that life is not happening to you, that it's responding to you or said another way that you don't just get what you want, you, you get who you are. Uh, these, these can be challenging messages for people to embody on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, it's something that our dad said often, actually, was you don't get in life what you want, you get what you are. And it was um, a statement that he would make because he understood that the universe is governed by laws. And one of those laws is the law of attraction, that what you put out comes back. Some people call it karma. Um, you know, there's all different ways of putting that, that uh, message into words. But essentially, I really struggled with that at a different time in my life um, after he passed when we talk about this in the program and, and in our book. And I struggled with that because I had so many bad things that were happening to me um, in a really short period of time. Um, I lost not only my father, but my stepson. Our finances were essentially gone. My husband was indicted uh, relating to his business. I was insecure about my body after having these two girls back to back, my two daughters back to back. On and on it goes. A lot, a lot of really traumatizing, um, difficult situations to go through. And I was really struggling because as I was raised, you take responsibility for everything that shows up in your life when you are um, on a spiritual path. That was a, a tenant in our household that you need to take responsibility for everything because the universe is responding to who you are. And so I felt guilty and I felt full of shame. Like I was somehow creating or attracting um, these difficult experiences. But then I started to understand it a little bit differently that perhaps in life, there are quote unquote bad things that happen to good people. And it's not because they attracted them or they manifested them, but perhaps I just have an open mind with this. Perhaps before they even uh, showed up here, before they even incarnated in this lifetime, they signed up, their soul signed up to grow. That we come here, we take on these bodies and these personalities and, and we become who we are because we want to grow. Our soul wants to grow and to expand. And that bad things happening are another way of... Um, sort of putting a negative spin on challenging things happening, things that that if you decide to get the message, things that you can become a better person because of having experienced, things that allow you to become closer to the person that you want to be, closer to God, closer to um, to the life that you want to have, or or some of these things can, allow you to stay stuck or to become a victim or to become, um, I, I think victim is really the best way to put it. And really ultimately the choice is yours. And so it's not always that you get in life what you are if you're putting the label of bad on these things that are happening to you. Another way of looking at it is you get in life what you might need to help you to grow into your highest potential. and. It's up to you if you want to see it that way or, or if you want to stay stuck. But sometimes these situations that occur in our lives are not actually bad or not actually harmful or not actually hurting us. They're, they're essentially rungs on the ladder that the Rumi poem says, the, the ladder that is placed before you at your birth. They are rungs on the ladder that you can climb if you choose to to bring yourself closer to God or closer to who you want to be. Um, but ultimately the choice is yours. Beautiful. Wow. A lot of wisdom there. Thank you, Serena. So Sage, you've received signs directly from your father following his passing. Can you, can you tell us about those? 
Yeah, absolutely. So many signs. Um, I talk a lot in the program about how I was, you know, at the beginning of my dad's passing, I would have described myself as both a skeptic in this idea that he was still with us, um, giving me signs and all of that, but also a believer. And I found myself at the beginning wanting proof. And as time went on, more and more signs started to show up for me that I just became a full-fledged believer, that I had no doubt anymore that my dad was with me. And one of my favorite ones to tell actually happened um, very soon after he passed. And it was one of the things that occurred for me that opened me up to this idea that he was definitely still with me, without a doubt. Um, what happened was, so in the weeks before my dad passed away, I had been traveling with him in Australia and in New Zealand, and um, he was on a book tour. And because my sister Sky and myself were part of the book tour, part of the show, I would get on stage and speak with him for maybe 20 or 30 minutes and my sister Sky would sing a song with him. So because we were part of the show, Hay House, um, his publishing company, paid for Sky and myself to uh, fly all throughout Australia and New Zealand. And being the wonderful company that they are, they paid for us to sit up in first class with my dad flying on these international flights. And um, that was something neither of us had ever done before. And the service and the seats and the airplanes, I mean, it was just this awesome experience. And my dad loved to tease us on these flights saying, you know, don't get used to this first class treatment. I'm not buying you first class tickets, you know, and he would look over at us on the flight and say, oh, are you enjoying your champagne and your, you know, your uh, pajamas and your pillow and your blanket and your lay flat seats and um, it just sort of became a running joke of the trip. My sister's husband, Mo, was also on this trip with us, but because he was not part of the show, Hay House did not pay for him to fly along. So he was sitting in coach on all of the same flights with us. My dad also loved to tease him, you know, and he would get on the plane. We would already be sat in our seats. He'd have to walk past us to get to his seats. And my dad would tease him and say, Oh, you know, if you get hungry, I'll save my bread roll for you. And <laughs> it became a running joke of this trip. And um, one of the things I learned about my dad on this trip was that his travel agent knew to put him in seat 2B. If seat 2B was available, he was always to put him in seat 2B because he just loved to tell the joke am I in seat to be or not to be? <laughs> and so, because my dad loved dorky dad jokes like that. And so um, on this trip, he was in seat to be on pretty much every flight. And that became one of his jokes that he would tell all the time. So now fast forward, I returned from this trip on August 28th of 2015. And on August 30th, my dad passed away. So this trip was very fresh in my mind, the memories we made on this trip, but, you know, I was thinking about them all the time. And five to six days after my dad passed away, my family planned a trip to go out to Maui, to Hawaii, to, we, we needed to go there to settle his affairs, but we also all felt very called to be there at that time. Um, that's where we grew up taking vacations. My dad lived there the last 15 years of his life. And we all just really wanted to be there. So Serena and I booked tickets to go out a day before the rest of my family. And the night before our flights were taking off, she called me and said, I just want you to know, I decided to upgrade my ticket to first class because it wasn't very expensive. And she had a six month old at the time. And she said, you know, I'm just so exhausted. I need the space. We're not buying a seat for Sailor, her daughter. So, and she said, you should upgrade your ticket too, because it wasn't that expensive. And I said, I thought about it and I was like, no, because she just wants me in first class. So I'll hold sailor the whole time. I said, no, I'm not going to spend the money. I am so tired. I could sleep standing up. I'm going to stay in my seat and coach and I'll be just fine. And she said, okay, you know, you're lost, whatever. We get to the airport the next morning and we're checking in um, and we're on different reservations. So she checked in and then I went up to check into the flight. And after I check in, um, the flight attendant hands me my ticket and says, okay, Miss Dyer, uh, enjoy your trip and enjoy first class. And I looked at her and I said, first class. <laughs> and then I was like, should I not say anything? So I didn't say anything. And I walked away and I went up to Serena and I was like, did you upgrade my ticket? And she was like, no, I didn't upgrade your ticket. Why would I do that? And I was like, well, this makes no sense because I have no frequent flyer status on this airline. You know, it wasn't an airline I had flown many times. 
Um, but I said, but I'm in first class. And then I looked down at my ticket and I was in seat 2B. <laughs> and, you know, there was never an explanation for why I got upgraded. There was no charge on my card. I had no status, like I said. And in that moment, I just knew that my dad had somehow managed to do this because I felt like what he was telling me was that, you know, at that time I was only 25 years old. I felt like he left me too soon. And I felt like, you know, I was still in school. I still needed him in a lot of ways. Um, and I felt like what he was saying to me was, I'm still taking care of you. I'll always take care of you. And it was such a meaningful moment, way beyond just the idea of getting to sit first class on this flight now, um, because I knew that that's what he was telling me. And as I became more open to these signs, I received more and more incredible, miraculous moments like that. And what I want anybody watching this to know is that you can receive these very same signs. There's nothing unique about just because I'm Wayne Dyer's daughter, it doesn't mean that I get some special privilege in this um, sign world. I think that our loved ones are always trying to give us signs and it's up to you to be open to them, to ask for them, and then to have your eyes open and be ready to see them. And, um, and in the, in the program that we do, you will learn how to do that. So I'm excited for you to, to see that, watch that and learn this for yourself. Wow. That's an amazing story and a great invitation to our audience. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for sharing that Sage. And it's so true. Every, everything you shared though. So, uh, wow. What a miracle that uh, C2B was. Yeah. Karen, I'm going to come back over to you. So in one of your communications with Wayne, he shared a new framework for living in the world that is truly paradigm shifting. Do you want to talk a little bit about this, Karen? Sure, sure. But let me begin uh, because what I start with has everything to do with what I'm going to say. So do you remember before I said it? Uh, there were synchronistic events that brought us all together on the bus, that author bus? Well, it was time to go back on that author bus from the uh, conference center to the hotel. And as I'm ready to board the bus, I see all of my favorite Hay House authors, and I'm a Hay House author too, boarding the bus as well as Wayne Dyer's family. And I said, I can't go on there, I'm so insignificant. And so I started to walk back to the hotel and I'm, I'm saying to myself, I'm so insignificant, I'm so insignificant. And that's when I heard him for the first time. And he shouted, get out of your own way, get out of your own way. And I said, Wayne, is that you, <laughs> if that's you? You have to give me a without a doubt sign to let me know it's really you. And I said, if that's you, how may I serve? And he said, you're already serving. I said, how may I serve more? So I walked back to the hotel and there was something very itchy inside of my shirt. So I reached in to see what it was. And it was a sticker that had somehow attached itself to the inside of my shirt. And on the sticker were the letters W-E on it. At that time, I thought it meant Wayne, first letter, last letter of his name. Because when I receive messages, oftentimes they tell me their name, first letter, last letter of their name and so forth. And then I felt him, he's laughing. He's saying, is that good enough sign? I said, oh my God, thank you so much. And I was like, oh, that's wonderful. And I was just so excited. That was it. Fast forward, then he started, you know, the meeting with the Dyers and that he started to come through for his family with very specific messages for years. And, you know, he has eight children and a wife and he came through, I think for six of you. Yes. And it was, I'd be making dinner or going for a walk six o'clock in the morning, text this one, call this one, this is happening and so forth. So it was coming singularly for them so that they would know without a doubt it was him. Now, what he really wanted to uh, come across with, he wanted to join forces with a group consciousness called the We Guides. Yes, you heard me right. We guides, that's the W-E that was on the sticker. He said he was going to join forces with a group consciousness called the We Guides. And they would, it would be hard to differentiate him from everyone else when he came through in that consciousness. It would be Ascended Masters, St. Francis of Assisi, angels and himself and so forth. And where, whereas he would come singularly for his family, he would still come through as a group consciousness, as the we consciousness. 
because he was so excited to talk about the we consciousness, which is the interconnectivity of everyone and everything. And whatever we do to ourselves or another, it affects everyone. And you don't feel that connection when we're here in the physical body because it feels like I'm over here and you're over there. But he was so excited to experience that now he felt that, that we are all one. And he was just so excited to share that with everyone. And he said he was going to uh, share 33 concepts of the we consciousness. And I said, why 33? And he said, 33 symbolized uh, divine guidance and the spiritual upliftment of all of mankind. And he said it was so needed at this time. And he foresaw all that was going to happen in the world. And there's a lot of the channeling in the back of the book and things that he foresaw and so forth. Um, it, it was just incredible. So that was the we consciousness. And basically what the we consciousness, one more thing, is that we are all one and that oneness includes everyone, all animals, all of nature, ascended masters, deceased loved ones, and that's why we could communicate with them, and beings from other dimensions. Okay. Wow. Thank you, Karen. And there's a lot more uh, to share on this topic. And isn't it interesting that uh, we're talking about this at a time when Nassim Harriman, this uh, physicist, is, is uh, coming out with his unified field theory, which in science is actually saying exactly what, what you just shared. Huh. Uh, so Karen, uh, let me bring another question over to you. You have a two-year waiting list as a medium to connect people to loved ones who have passed into the afterlife. Can you share a little bit about the process and perhaps share a way that viewers can begin to open themselves up to the possibility of communicating with those that they know who have passed? Well, this is great because it's not about Karen Noe receiving messages. And this is what I told the daughters. I told Serena that to you the first time I met you, <clears throat> it's you look for the signs, you ask for the dreams. And I'll explain in a minute. Our deceased loved ones are trying to speak to us as much as we're trying to speak to them. They're giving us, I call them without a doubt signs to let us know they're with us. It'll give their name, their address. The song will come on with the perfect words, you know, that we need to hear at the perfect time. You may keep here seeing the numbers 1111 or 2222 and so forth. I could go on and on and on. So I would say, ask your loved one to give you a sign to let you know they're with you. I would say to tell them to give, to come to you in a dream and to wake you up after the dream so that you remember it because or else if you don't wake up, you'll dream the whole night and you won't remember it. Then the most important thing is to be patient and wait and the signs and the dreams will come when you least expect it. And the more you pay attention to the signs and the dreams, the more they will continue to come to you. And you don't have to be a medium to experience this. Okay. And a lot more on this topic too. So let me uh, just take this moment to say thank you, Sage, Serena, and Karen. And while we've just shared some powerful things with you, that truly there's so much more, which is why then we've worked together with Karen, Sage, and Serena to create a brand new masterclass for anyone who feels inspired to go deeper into these life-changing uh, things that we've just talked about. So let's uh, go ahead and unveil this now. Again, we've all been working together for quite some time to create this program. It's called Life After Death, Dr. Wayne Dyer's teachings from the afterlife and the training to receive your own messages. And when I say life-changing, I truly mean it as this masterclass will entail a complete lifting of the veil between life and death and will open up a whole new world of possibility for our lives where death is no longer something to fear because we understand there is no such thing as death. <laughs> we also understand the interaction between ourselves and those who no longer live in their physical bodies can bring new dimensions of healing and growth to us as individuals and to the whole of humanity. So now in this, this eight week, 55 module masterclass, Serena and Sage will be sharing more stories about their dad along with their own powerful messages. And Karen will not only be sharing the full 33 messages that Wayne has shared with the world, she'll also be teaching people how to become mediums themselves. And all I can say is, wow, uh, this may be the most action packed and content rich masterclass that humanity's team has ever offered. Now, before we go back to Karen, let's watch masterclass excerpts from Sage and Karen that go a little deeper. 
So for the next two years, I continued to receive messages for his family and his wife with very important messages. Now, he has eight children as well. So it was at least one or two a week. I'd have to call them at a very specific times. I'll give you three of those messages, very uh, clear messages from him. One, it was six o'clock in the morning. And I heard Wayne loudly and clearly, and he said, call Tracy now, call Tracy now. Now, Tracy is his oldest daughter, and I'm debating with him. I said, it's six o'clock in the morning. And he said, call her now, call her now. I said, okay. So I texted Tracy I, beforehand. I said, Tracy, is it okay I could, for me to call you? And she immediately responded with, yes, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. So I called her and I said, before you say anything, this is what your dad is saying to me. Yes, he can hear you, but you can't hear him. She just started to cry. And I said, what's the matter? She said, Karen, I just woke up from a dream. And in the dream, I was yelling at my dad and I said, can't you hear me? Can't you hear me? And her dad came through and said, yes, I can hear you, but you can't hear me. So that's the type of message that he would give to his, to his family. Let me give you two more. Um, one day I was at work and I decided to go to the bank. I had my computer open. And when I came back, there was an email that I uh, had received from Wayne Dyer's son, Sands, about maybe six months before that. I said, what the heck? Why is this on my, my screen? And I'm looking at the email and I said, oh, okay. Wayne wants me to call Sands. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm so used to this. So I call Sands and he doesn't answer the phone, but he texts me and said he was on a plane ready for takeoff. And he said, Karen, I was just asking my dad for a sign. I'm on my way to Hawaii, moving there from Florida. And I wanted to know if it was a good move. And I said, your dad is saying, live your dreams, live your dreams. On one hand, it's grief, and if you're looking for a loved one. On the other hand, it's, are you uh, just looking for divine guidance from the universe? Are you, you know, you want to set out on a new venture, or you feel lost in your life, and you want to get yourself on the right path? I have come to find that the universe is always guiding, quietly, but in a, in a, with a strong force. And if we tune in, the signs are there for that, too. Um, I'm going to talk in a later module about this idea of the path of least resistance. You know, I think the universe offers resistance or when you find yourself met with resistance, that is you swimming against the tide, you know, but there is always an opportunity to swim with the tide and we just have to get into that place. And I feel that there's always divine guidance available for that. And um, one other thing that I wanted to share here about this uh, is, you know, I find that I am more tuned in. I find I get more signs and I get more guidance when I'm in a place of joy, when my energy is vibrating high. Uh, you know, it's like when we feel angry or sad or ashamed, we're sort of vibrating lower. And it, I, I think the proof there is like, other people feel it. It's like you go, you meet somebody and they just have this beautiful bubbly energy and you're drawn to them. Or you meet somebody who's angry and judgmental and you're sort of repel, they repel you, you know? And I think we're all capable of both types of energies and frequencies. And I certainly find myself at times feeling very joyful and children are attracted to me. And, you know, I feel funny. I feel light. And then there are times where I don't feel that way. Um, and, uh, you know, my dad, his voicemail on his phone for the last, I don't know, as long as I can remember, 15 years of his life was, this is Wayne Dyer that you've reached, and I want to feel good. So if your message is designed to do anything else, you've reached the wrong number, and perhaps you should call Dr. Phil. <laughs> he just wanted to be funny. But the bigger takeaway from that was that he wanted to feel good because feeling good is feeling God. Um, our loved ones leave here, this physical world where our energy is slowed way down to be in the physical state. And this is just chemistry, is science. When something's in the physical state, the particles are barely moving. 
when you put it into a gaseous state, they're, they're vibrating everywhere very fast, a much faster energy and frequency. And I, and that's, you know, we're here in the physical. Our loved ones are up here vibrating at a different frequency. If we want to merge with them, we got to go to that place of joy. Wow. Beautiful. Now, Karen, let's go back over to you as we talk more about this masterclass. The masterclass begins with you sharing all the details about the 33 messages that Wayne asked you to help him share with the world and that participants will be receiving uh, these daily videos for the first 33 days of the program. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, this part of the masterclass, the beginning, and these 33 modules that are going to go out one each day at the beginning of the masterclass? Sure. So the whole masterclass begins with this first module, which is about the weak consciousness. And I will discuss in more depth, you know, all the synchronistic events, what happened and what exactly is the weak consciousness. And as you said, you will be receiving um, there's 33 concepts. Each day you will be receiving another concept and what it means, what what they meant and what we can do to make the world a better place. Um, and basically we talk about how we are all one, as I described before. And I'll also share some of the channeled messages from Wayne. As I said, he was so excited to talk about the afterlife. And um, so I actually share with you what he talked about in the afterlife and what he experienced and things that are happening in the world. So it's really exciting. And we're starting the whole masterclass with that. So yes, so this really is how should I'm enroll in this class. And I'll tell you, you will not be sorry. So this is how the masterclass begins. So, and then Serena, you and Sage have obviously been called to be leaders in the world following in the footsteps of your dad. Can you share briefly about the 11 masterclass modules and why you're so passionate that these messages are being brought to the world through this masterclass? Well, I believe that um, this message is just, you know, as we were working on this, I think one of the things that Sage and I realized was that um, each of these modules and each of these essentially um, aspects that we wrote about also in our book, but we go into much more depth during the modules because we had, um, you know, the time and the space to do that here um, with this platform. But essentially, each of these um, modules are based around things that we had ex we had experienced ourselves, and as a result of having experienced them and and learning from them, we were better people because of it. And what I mean by that is. Um, Take, for example, uh, the idea of forgiveness. And sometimes, as Sage mentioned before, you know, our dad had a life changing experience with forgiveness. I did, too. But sometimes forgiveness, we forget, is about forgiving ourselves or it's about taking ourselves off of the hook um, from so much of what we might end up carrying around inside that we don't realize we are. So I think it's so important to get these messages out into the world because choosing to live from a spiritual love filled place not only changes your own life but it changes the lives of those around you of those in your family and it ultimately ends up changing the world because if more and more people are living from that place then ultimately we have a more love filled world right so i think that helping people to understand as we have experienced ourselves um helping people to understand that when you shift toward living from a more spiritual place, your entire life improves, has become a passion of both Sage and mine. Um, it's something that we enjoy speaking about. It's something that we enjoy sharing. And it's something that we enjoy because we have seen for ourselves how different our lives have become having allowed these lessons to, um, to do with us what they needed to do and ultimately to become more love-filled ourselves. Beautiful. Okay, so uh, Sage, another big question for you here. So do you see this masterclass as perhaps a pivotal teaching where people in the world will begin to see the veil that is lifted between life and the afterlife, allowing this paradigm shift that I mentioned a little earlier to eventually happen for all of humanity and what that might mean for our world? Yes, absolutely see it as... Um a pivotal teaching that could help people to lift that veil because uh, ultimately like Serena just touched on, this is what happened for me after my dad passed. You know, um, I had to lift that veil, so to speak. I was initially completely cut off from him and from um, his 
his energy that is still very much with me now. So through the process of opening myself up to uh, this idea that he was still here with me, I, you know, lifted the veil, so to speak. And so Serena and Karen and I in this program will take you on our journey of um, reconnecting with our loved ones. And I, I wholeheartedly believe that if enough people watch this, there can be a paradigm shift. Um, I recently read the book by Malcolm Gladwell, The Tipping Point, where he talks about this notion that, you know, there just needs to be enough momentum for an idea or um, an idea or a piece of information. If it spreads far and wide enough, there becomes this tipping point where it's unstoppable. And that's what I really foresee for our masterclass. Big. A tipping point for humanity. So, and boy, isn't that needed now? <laughs> I think yeah. that's one thing the whole world <laughs> would agree agree to is that uh, we uh, we need to see change. So, a tipping point now. Uh, certainly, it's time. Karen, so during this masterclass, you will also be providing participants with nine modules of mediumship training, so so they can learn how to communicate with the afterlife for themselves and for others, including experimenting in practice sessions with their fellow participants. Can you share a little bit about this process? Sure, so first of all, let me say, it's everything that Wayne Dyer would say. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. It's not the other way around. And the energy of who we are continues after the physical body dies. And that's not something I think or believe. It's something I know without a doubt. And my wish is for everyone to understand that too. And it's just, as I said before, we all can do this. I've been teaching this course for decades now, and I've been traveling the country teaching this course. We're going to be talking about first what happens after the, phys the physical body dies. We're gonna be talking about the signs that they give us that we were talking about before, uh, the without a doubt signs, such as the bird, the ladybug, the dragonfly, the rainbow that appears out of nowhere when we're, it's their, your loved one's birthday. I'm going to be talking about how to raise your vibration so it's more on par with the energy of your deceased loved ones because their energy is up here and our energy is down here. And in order to hear them, we have to be on the same frequency. So I teach you how to do that, how to practice forgiveness, what the dyers will be talking about and become more compassionate and so forth. All of these things will help you to connect. I'll be teaching you how to release anything that's preventing you from receiving messages. As, and I'm gonna teach you a technique called tapping. So you could tap out all those negative uh, feelings within you so that you could then affirm that you can connect with your deceased loved ones. We're gonna talk about the different clairs, how to receive messages, clairvoyance, clairsentience, claircognizance, and clairaudience. Did I say clairaudience? I, any case, <laughs> the four ways of receiving messages, we're going to be doing fun exercises in them as well. One of which is our deceased loved ones love to send us pictures. So they come as a picture comes in your mind. Say you're reading a book about the red schoolhouse and you see the red schoolhouse in your mind's eye. That's how they come. So I'll be sending you a picture. I'll be looking at a picture, sending it to you. You're gonna close your eyes and try to receive the picture just to show you how your deceased loved one is giving you these signs. I'm going to be taking you on guided meditations, what the chakras are, how to clear them, and how that's necessary in order to connect with your deceased loved ones. Another guided meditation, how to connect with your deceased loved one, and so forth. So I could go on and on and on. But again, this is not about Karen Noe. This is about you, and you can do it. I promise you. And that's why we're putting this whole thing together. So again, I say, wow, 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 as they did a little earlier, this 55 module program where we go along on this journey with the whole Dyer family. And then with you, Sage and Serena, your own individual journey with these lessons that you've learned and you're bringing to people. And then Karen's uh, 33 messages, they're actually Wayne Dyer's 33 messages for the world brought through Karen. And then this mediumship training where Karen, where you're training people to be a medium to their loved ones in the afterlife. So this is why I was sharing this may be the most packed matching uh, masterclass that humanities team has ever offered. 
So Serena, I'm gonna come back to you. Uh, you've been drawing large audiences with Sage during speaking engagements, and there's even a documentary that's being made now about all of what we're discussing. Your dad had said you and Sage would be continuing his work and would be instrumental in this huge shift that's taking place on the planet now as your masterclass part of the process in helping people to pivot in this whole new direction and, and uh, live more empowered lives. Yeah, um, I don't I don't know if I heard the question there, but I can say that, um, yes, absolutely, we are doing that. And I think um, the reason that Sage and I feel called to do this is is this is going to sound very strange, but I don't think that we realized that we had a unique or different upbringing when we were children. I, in fact, in many ways, don't think that we realized how unusual it was to grow up with um you know, I joke an Uncle Deepak or to have um, monks that are friends and to learn transcendental meditation at the age of five. Um, I, I think that for me, um, it, it wasn't even actually until after my dad passed that I realized that I had absolutely no doubt in my mind that he was still here. And I had no um no doubt that I would be able to receive signs and messages from him. At times I was frustrated because I wanted the signs and the messages um, to come through in the form of like, you know, a dolphin swimming up right next to me if I were in the ocean or like lightning bolts to go off in my backyard, you know, something crazy. But um, actually having worked with Karen um, and, and really taken to heart so much of what she will talk about in this program, um, I've come to understand that she's absolutely right. It's sort of like getting quiet and raising your own energy. And I've learned so much from her. And I know that everybody um, that participates in this will as well about um, being able to become in harmony with receiving the messages yourself, not having, you know, in the beginning, I think that we probably talked to Karen all of the time and in the beginning, meaning right after he passed. And now it's not something that we do nearly as frequently, but that's because I speak for Sage and I uh, both when I say that we've become capable at receiving the messages ourselves now. And I do believe that's from having worked with Karen. And I do believe that's from applying a lot of what she's going to teach. Um, and I also think it's because I've raised my own energies. I've changed myself. As I said before, I'm, I'm no longer like a victim of some of the bad things that have happened. I've actually become a more loving, kind good person because of them, better person because of them. And, um, and I think that that is available for everyone. And, you know, it's so interesting because it, it blows my mind that some people don't believe that, that the soul goes on and they don't believe that they can get signs or messages from their loved ones. And I think how many people would change for the better if they could understand if they could really know the way that Sage and Karen and I really know, if they could really know that um, the soul goes on, how differently would they live their lives? You know, really understanding that all of the all of the money that you accumulate and all of the um, you know possessions, the physical possessions that you you know compile during your lifetime, don't go anywhere with you, but your soul's growth, your energy does, and also how many people that are struggling um, in pain because they are in such profound grief, having lost a loved one, how different would their life be if they could actually know that their loved one was not only okay, but right there with them. Um, and that's why I think that this, this program is so important. And I think it really can change people's lives, not only to live closer to, um, closer to God and love and God consciousness while alive, um, but also letting go of like the grief of, of people that they've lost that are no longer here in the physical. Now, let me just say really quickly, grief is okay, but some people, um, they remain committed to their sadness for the rest of their life. And how differently would they feel if they actually knew, as we know, that their loved one really was still here, right there with them. No kidding. Full lifting of the veil. And of course, you covered so much more, you know, in <laughs> terms of people living empowered lives. Wow. You know, wow, wow, wow. So it's why humanity's team is so excited to be bringing this masterclass to the world for these teachings, 
uh, things that can change our individual and collective lives or what. Right. So let's, uh, let's now review all of what you get with this uh, Life After Death Masterclass. So it's called Life After Death, Dr. Wayne Dyer's Teachings from the Afterlife and the Training to Receive Your Own Messages. So in part one, uh, Wayne Dyer's Teachings uh, from the Afterlife. So this is where Karen comes in at the very beginning, module one, and shares about the process by which Wayne reached out to her to talk about we guides and these 33 messages that would be coming through. Now, in tandem with that, then from day one of the masterclass, uh, all 33 modules will be sent out one a day for the first 33 days of the masterclass. Part two is this, uh, the knowing continuing in Wayne Dyer's legacy. This is where in modules two through 12, Sage Dyer and Serena Dyer Pasoni uh, bring forward these important teachings that they were called to share with the world. Those, this is modules two through 12. In part three, mediumship training to receive your own messages from the other side. And here, uh, Karen Noe in this section uh, brings forward in the masterclass this whole process for you becoming a trained medium. It includes this weekly training where you're going to be experienced with experiencing with other people who are going through the program this whole process for becoming a medium where you're training with others who are going through the cohort. Uh, there's a module, then the final module, 55, uh, and this is the sum of the parts. So this is the advice and guidance uh, that you'll get as you, as you step through this whole process to this deeper understanding and more empowered life. It's the wrap up module at the very begin, uh, very end of the masterclass. This is Karen Noe, a Sage and Serena doing the wrap up. Now, other parts of this masterclass, there's, it includes mentoring as humanities team masterclasses always do. There are two 60 minute mentoring programs. One is with uh, Karen Noe. So, and then there's another 60 minute mentoring session with Sage and Serena together. And of course, mentoring is one of the most praised features of, the, of our humanities team masterclasses. Then you're gonna receive transcripts of all the core module teachings so you can read as well as watch the video programs. Well, there's a bonus uh, in, in humanities team. We like to do this with our new master classes. It's called a virtual fireside chat. And so we invite you to really spend quality time on the program page between now and midnight Pacific tomorrow night, because where you register by midnight Pacific tomorrow night, you're gonna be invited to this virtual fireside chat. It's with Karen, Sage, and Serena. Uh, I'll be hosting it where we're going to be talking about all the things that you can do to get that maximum, the very most out of this uh, eight-week masterclass. So be sure to uh, thoughtfully review the program page today and tomorrow so you can uh, be a part of that uh, program. You won't want to miss it. Of course, there's a private Facebook group and Humanities Team has its own social network that you're going to be invited to. Now, as we're looking at pricing, as you can see, you get a nice discount on this Life After Death Masterclass as a, as a standalone program. And then for only a little more, you get Life After Death Lifetime Access and hundreds of other transformational education programs on the Humanity Stream Plus platform. Be sure to explore the library and check out the one-click feature that gives you access to programs by simply clicking once. Also, this is a true streaming platform. So you can gain access to programs on the big screen, small screen, and any room in your home or wherever you might be. The plus in Humanity Stream Plus means you are a part of a community and get invitations to all the live mentoring programs as new programs are launched. You are invited to go face-to-face -face with new faculty every week during our programs with special guests. And there are two weekly watch parties, free certificates of completion, free upgrades, and so much more. Humanity Stream Plus is now more affordable than ever. At $399, it costs only a little more than the average masterclass. And did you know that when you subscribe, you gift a free subscription to an underprivileged, underserved individual who cannot afford our streaming platform at any price? You become a light out in the world. Be sure to check out all of what you get when you subscribe to Humanity Stream Plus. Uh, so, uh, invite you again on the program page, spend quality time there looking at all of what is uh, here, the 55 modules, all of these things that I've 
just gone through. Look at Humanity Stream Plus with all of what that is and then the standalone masterclass and make the decision that's right for you. A cohort is gonna be going through very shortly with uh, Sage, Serena, Karen, uh, and uh, I know many of you will wanna be part of it. So uh, we just, I'll just share, we look forward to having you with us uh, when we go through here shortly. And uh, also wanna thank you for being here with us today. Serena, any final wrap up words that you'd like to share as we uh, wrap up this program? I mean, I think it's really just um, ultimately all changes in life and all changes in our life that we are um, seeking. It really starts with the first step. It starts with a, a single step in the right direction um, toward changing your own life because it's not gonna change just because you want it to. <laughs> you have to have the intention with the action. And I think that um, surrounding yourself with this type of material is obviously a really powerful first step toward, um, toward changing your life into the direction or into the place of wherever it is that you would like it to be. Um, so it can't just be manifesting, you know, the six pack abs while you're eating the ding dongs on the couch, you know, it's the intention with the action. And um and it's something that is a lesson I've absolutely had to learn myself. And I look forward to sharing more about that with you in this program. Sage, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with our audience? Sure. Yeah. I mean, what comes to mind for me is um, it's a quote that I've heard from Rumi and that I love to say to myself on a regular basis. And that is what you seek is seeking you. So when you go out into the world and you take these messages with you, just remember that the things that you want in your life are, are trying to make their way to you. And a lot of times it's just getting out of your own way, getting into that flow, being open, surrendering, and just say to yourself again and again, what I seek is seeking me. Know it deep within you and it will be true. Yeah, yeah, love that. Uh, doors are often wide open in front of us and uh, we don't walk through. All right, thank you. And I want to just, I want to thank the whole Dyer family, uh, you know, your mom, Marceline, your whole family for bringing the, these uh, important messages to the world. It's, uh, as we discuss, this is really, really important. And uh, Karen Noe, I want to thank you for just being the uh, talented, uh, heartful, medium that you are that has been such an integral part of this so so thank you and viewers hey thanks for being with us uh this cohort is going through join us uh wow this is a life-changing program look forward to being with you